Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lauren Hurl and I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Conservation Voters. And I am really excited to be with you all today to talk about an important and historic election where Vermont voters sent a clear and resounding message that we want leaders willing to take strong action on the climate crisis and ensure a healthier, more resilient future for our communities. While it's not yet clear what the national landscape will look like, we already know that Vermont voters elected more climate champions to the Vermont legislature than ever before. We consistently see our work in communities around the state and in polling, and we saw again in these election results that the climate crisis and a healthy environment are issues of high concern to Vermont voters. The candidates who questioned climate science and opposed climate action were resoundingly defeated, while the candidates who spoke about the benefits of not just doing our part on the most pressing issue facing humanity, but who also recognize that acting on climate means we're creating good paying jobs while building communities that are cleaner and healthier, more equitable and more affordable. These candidates overwhelmingly won their races, meaning we'll have significant majorities of lawmakers at the State House ready to get to work building a brighter future for Vermont. So today you're gonna to hear about some of the important work that Vermont Conservation Voters and BPIRG Votes Political Action Committees did to help elect pro-environment candidates. And I'm pleased to be joined today by some key allies, including Paul Burns of VPIRG, along with um, a couple key members of the Climate Solutions Caucus, Representative and Senator-elect Becca White and Representative Gabrielle Stebbins, as well as Johanna Miller of the Vermont Natural Resources Council and Jordan Hyden of VPIRG. And I'd like to take a moment to thank some of the many partners we've worked with this election season, including the Alliance for a Better Vermont Action Fund and Planned Parenthood of Vermont Action Fund. So we're gonna share with you in a moment, a short video highlighting some of the work we did this election season and why it matters. And then we'll hear a bit about the types of climate action we anticipate working on in the upcoming legislative session to respond to this mandate from voters. And we'll hear about some ways that Vermonters can get involved in climate efforts in the coming weeks and months. So first, let's watch the video. So this might take a moment to load, so bear with us. Vermont state fish, the brook trout, can only survive in cool, clean water. Much like the brook trout, Vermonters rely on a clean, healthy environment, but unlike the brook trout, Vermonters can vote. In the 2022 election, Vermont voters made their voices heard, electing strong majorities of pro-climate candidates across the state. Vermonters love the great outdoors, but climate change threatens so much about what makes our state special. The environmental community knows that we need leaders who will take strong action on climate. It takes collaboration, coordination, and commitment. Which is why together, Vermont Conservation Voters and VPIRG Votes worked hard to support pro-environment candidates and educate voters on where their leaders stand on the climate crisis. This election season, we went all out. Recruiting and training candidates, hosting forums and debates, financially supporting candidates, hitting the phones, radio, and digital media, and knocking on doors like never before. Now it's time to get to work on building a just, equitable future for every Vermonter. We can bring hundreds of millions of dollars of federal investments into Vermont to benefit our families and businesses. We can put thousands of Vermonters to work, build renewable energy, weatherize our homes and modernize our electric grid, improve the way we get around, and support communities most impacted by climate change. So to protect those who voted and those who can't, now is the time to act. Great, thank you. I'm gonna now turn it over to Paul Burns to speak a little bit more about the work we did this election season and what the results mean. Paul, we can't hear you if you're talking.
Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, great. And can you see the screen? Yes. Awesome, technology working, thank you very much. Um, so I wanna say I'm really happy to be here. Um, thanks everybody for gathering um, for this conversation. Um, a real pleasure to be with uh, our colleagues who helped to make some good things happen. And of course, with a couple of key legislative leaders as well. As the video that, that you just saw makes clear, I think that the um, climate community really stepped up and delivered in 2022. Our efforts at candidate recruitment, training and endorsements uh, was really uh, beyond anything that we had done before. We hosted most uh, multiple forums around climate. Our staff and volunteers conducted more voter contact in 2022 than ever before, including phone calls, text, direct mail, radio, digital uh, communications. And of course, VPIRG Votes did what we do best, going door to door in uh, communities and key districts around the state. Our efforts paid off, and while it's too soon to have a full analysis, we can look at some of the key races, in particular, uh, one key race that caught some observers by surprise. This was the uh, district from uh, Pittenden North, the Senate district there. We spent a lot of time knocking on doors in this district. Early voter turnout in this district was 41%. Of all the people who voted uh, here, 41% voted uh, early. and um, that shows uh, that we can contrast that with the folks that we talked to in going door to door where 53% of them voted early. In an election that was decided by just 315 votes, that hard work and those communications we think really paid off. This district was not an outlier. Our climate champions helped to, uh, uh, our support for climate champions helped to deliver victories across the state uh, and down the ballot. Some of the climate champs helped to oust those who were uh, most recalcitrant in doing anything to address um, the climate crisis. Here are a few examples. We also have uh, climate champs who moved up, some who moved from the House to the Senate. I'm very excited about that. Some who moved from the legislature to statewide office, which is awesome. Sarah Copeland Hansis, our incoming Secretary of State, for instance, has led the Climate Solutions Caucus in the legislature for the last two terms. And we also have a great group of incoming climate champs. In addition to uh, Tanya Bihovsky uh, and Becca White, we have others who that you can see on the screen here. And many new ones in the house as well, too many for uh, a single slide. We also wanna point out that of the many climate champions who won, it also means some of the worst climate deniers ended up losing seats in the legislature. Almost across the board, the worst of the climate deniers lost their bids for office. The entire slate of climate opponents in Addison County, for instance, lost, as did candidates who built their campaigns around attacks on a boogeyman carbon tax, uh, or that sort of uh, thing. And of course, uh, one lesson that we take from this election is really clear. That is that Vermonters wanna see climate action and they want to see it now. And we are so thrilled to be joined by a couple of the real champions um, in this effort. And it is uh, my um, ha happy uh, task to uh, introduce to you all my friend and a new incoming Senator, uh, House current House member, Becca White, Senator-elect. Becca? Thanks, Paul. Um, and great slide. Uh, we had a race here in Windsor County for Windsor County State Senate. And uh, one of the main themes we heard from our opponents was no carbon tax boogeyman rhetoric. So it really shows that Vermonters came out and voted uh, to elect folks who actually are going to do the important work of responding to climate change. So really excited to be here and thrilled to be able to be a part of the Climate Solutions Caucus moving from the House to the Senate. I just want to tell you briefly about two things, which is that first, we have seen the election results, and that's going to transform into policy victories. Uh, Vermonters have elected us, and now it's our job to put uh, that vote to good use. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, with an even larger Climate Solutions Caucus, uh, just numbers wise, and even more strong advocates in the mix that we'll be able to get uh, that work done. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you about. 
Uh, and then the second thing uh, is that the Climate Solution Caucus, we've been around for a while. Uh, we're one of the largest caucuses in the state house. We're uh, across the House and the Senate, uh, and we're nonpartisan. Uh, and one of the key things that this race has shown us is that we can be more assertive, we can be bolder in the asks that we have uh, going into this 2023 session. So you'll be seeing that. Uh, and it's not just uh, the Senate side that's going to be doing fantastic work. It's going to be the House. Uh, so I'm thrilled that I get to work alongside uh, Representative Gabrielle Stebbins, who I'd love to pass the baton to to tell us uh, a bit more. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Senator-elect White. I will miss you sitting next to me in the Transportation Committee. What I love about the news of these results is that the connection that some people have made about addressing climate change and having that not be a win for our communities and for our home bank accounts, that that connection was resoundingly called out to be false. The truth is we send out one and a half, nearly one and a half billion dollars a year on fossil fuels by heating our homes, and driving our cars. Imagine if we actually were able to figure out policies to take that one and a half billion dollars and reinvest it in our families, our businesses, our schools, our communities here in Vermont. That is what I'm really excited about looking at. A couple of the policies that we've been discussing um, are market driven. They're really designed to work with businesses, nonprofits, state agencies, homes, in a way that makes shifting off of fossil fuels affordable and ultimately a win-win-win so that we can have really good climate workforce jobs that pay good salaries so that we can go home, pay our bills, and not worry about affordability while wondering how to get to our job that might be three counties away. Over. So I'm very excited about uh, re bringing back the clean heat standard. That's an opportunity to work with several different Vermont businesses uh, to really help Vermonters lower the cost to heat their home. Uh, and also there are a lot of regional efforts. We have a meeting coming up in early December. Uh, now that we have a Massachusetts and a Connecticut governor um, that are likely both very supportive of regional efforts to address our shared transportation challenges. That's one of the that's one of the policy areas that really we need to work together beyond Vermont to address. Really excited to also look at the renewable electricity, renewable energy standard, um, particularly with all the federal dollars coming our way. Uh, it's it's critical to make it possible for Vermonters to capitalize on those dollars and bring both the one and a half billion in as well as those federal uh, Inflation Reduction Act dollars. And lastly, looking really carefully at how we plan, how we develop, how we grow Vermont's economy and what that means for our land and our water and our animals and our air quality. Because all of that comes back to, can we live in a place that can support our families and our communities? We have great opportunities here and I'm so grateful that our numbers are what they are. Passing the torch. Great, thank you so much. And now we're gonna hear from Johanna Miller of the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Representative Stebbins, and thank you everyone. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say a couple things. As you've heard and as we know, there are tremendous benefits to acting on climate, cutting costs, um, enhancing public health, creating a more equitable energy system. And it's really exciting to have such a strong mandate from Vermonters to undertake this work. Thankfully, um, we also have a climate action plan adopted last December, crafted by the Climate Council, of which I am the environmental rep on that council. Um, we worked hard within our five subcommittee structure uh, to engage the public um, to craft a plan um, to provide a blueprint and a roadmap for strategic action to reduce greenhouse gas pollution and build more resilient Vermont. So that is an important foundation to do the work that Vermonters have clearly charged us to do. So now it's time to get to work with that unprecedented slate of new elected officials and a bench of lawmakers who've already been working hard in their respective roles, including uh, the two champs we just heard from, uh, to make the significant progress that we need to 
to meet our legally binding pollution reduction targets, as well as help our communities adapt and become more resilient in a warming world. So we're looking forward to doing that with policymakers as well as the public. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Jordan Hyden to talk about some of the nearer term efforts to continue to make sure that we are partnering with Vermonters and engaging Vermont communities, um, partnering with policymakers to ensure that we make this transition, make it swiftly, make, what, make it equitable. Jordan, tell us what's on deck. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I did share some slides. Hopefully you can see those. Let me know if not. Um, but again, good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Hyden. I use she, her pronouns, and I am VPIRG's Keep Vermont Cool campaign manager. So as you've heard, we have recently experienced some really exciting victories here in Vermont, and now it's time to get back to work. So I'm thrilled to share some details for two upcoming opportunities, both completely free and open to the public. So first, I want to let you know that VPIRG's Keep Vermont Cool campaign and Senator-elect Becca White are hosting a Climate Action and Advocacy Tour, a multi-county event series we've developed to reflect on the recent election, to discuss climate impacts and opportunities in the coming legislative session, and to inspire and empower Vermonters to take meaningful climate action. We'll feature many local legislators and partner organizations throughout this effort, which will be announced very soon. We anticipate that each interactive 90-minute event will include mixing and mingling, a post-election and climate presentation, an advocacy training, and meet and greet with legislators, music, food, drinks, tabling resources, and of course, lots of swag and giveaways. All current and upcoming event details can be found on our website, keepvermontcool.org tour. And we will be posting information on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts at Keep Vermont Cool shortly. So next, I am excited to also share details for the 15th annual VCAN conference, a multi-day virtual event tailored largely to the state's network of all volunteer town energy committees. This event will commence on Saturday, December 10th at 9 a.m. and will be accompanied by a series of virtual workshops throughout the following week on a timely energy and climate action topic focused on transforming our transportation, heating, and power supplies equitably, affordably, and swiftly in rural Vermont. So again, everyone is welcome, including you all. It's completely free. And to learn more and register, you can visit vcan.net. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Jordan. And so at this point, as you can tell, we are enthusiastic about the election results and the climate mandate that voters have sent and have some really exciting upcoming work and opportunities for Vermonters to get engaged in this work. And now we would love to uh, answer any questions that um, anyone might have. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, so the, the House now has um, a, a super majority. I think Dems have, have a larger showing in the House than, um, than, than ever before. Uh, I wonder, obviously, the clean heat standard you've said is coming back. I wonder if there's any other legislation that you might take the opportunity to try and pass, given how strong that supermajority is this year. I'm thinking maybe particularly of Act 250, which I know uh, experienced some challenges last year. I'm assuming that's uh, my turn. Uh, yes, thanks, Emma. Uh, certainly, I, I do believe there will be um, a fair amount of discussion around Act 250. Uh, obviously, last year, there was a lot of discussion about how to balance the need, for example, for more uh, affordable housing. Uh, and where do we where do we build? Where do we not build? And how do I how do we identify those appropriate locations? And a key tool for that is Act 250. So I'm fairly certain we'll see that come back up. Um, the renewable energy standard, I suspect we will be seeing that come back up as well, um, in part uh, because we haven't touched on it um, in a number of years, but also in part because the Inflation Reduction Act has so many uh, opportunities there that taking a moment to look at our statute to assess what aligns with federal opportunities and what might need to be changed really does help um, to make sure that we're capitalizing on as much opportunity as possible from the feds. 
Um, and, uh, you know, transportation wise, we have done great work uh, in the last couple of years, uh, really harnessing, again, the federal dollars to offer Vermonters of all income ranges the opportunity to spend less on getting from A to B. But uh, we're, we're needing now to really look more comprehensively and regionally at how do we crack this nut? Because it, it really is beyond the Vermont borders. And that's why I'm very, very excited. Uh, Senator-elect and myself uh, went to a conference last month in Rhode Island and spoke with other senators and representatives from Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, all to discuss how do we come back uh, to figure out um, what the next, uh, if it's the Transportation Climate Initiative, if it's something different, what that next tool in the toolbox uh, needs to be, because avoiding this does not help our constituents. What it does is kick the cost down the road, and it will just become more costly. So it is our requirement to really pick this up and work together. And I would just add to Representative Seven's point, we're in the strange period between folks being elected, leadership not being yet elected, and soon to be the session and all of those holidays that we celebrate in the middle. Uh, so what we've seen from voters is a clear mandate around responding to climate change. So now it's our job as folks who have been elected to make the case to bring those policies to the top of the priority list to our leadership. And I know that with the amount of folks who've been elected, that clear majority you mentioned in the House and one in the Senate as well, we're going to be able to make a stronger case to prioritize climate legislation like the ones that you heard from Representative Stebbins. So it's still in flux, but it's now the time to make the case. And that's what we'll be doing as we lead up to January. Thank you both. Any other questions? Uh, hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for um, having me, Calvin, here with um, Channel 3. I. I can s just see our, our inbox now, um, you know, some Vermonters certainly might have concerns about their bottom line and about affordability, um, you know, especially with uh, gas prices and home heating fuel prices. I'm, I'm wondering just broadly, maybe if, if um, some of our elected leaders or others could just speak about how you would, you know, contend with the affordability question and what you'd say to people uh, and Vermonters who are, are concerned with, um, you know, whether it be a TCI or a clean heat standard, that type of thing. Since you did call it elected leaders, I guess I'll take this one first. But um, we've also had folks who were at the doors of Vermonters across the state who heard that exact concern. And I, when I've had conversations with folks in Windsor County as I was door knocking, that was one of the big concerns. It was housing and the cost of living. So when I talk to Vermonters about that nexus of concern with climate change is to express that the cost of doing nothing is so much greater in the long term than responding to it now. Also, it will support our economic goals to be able to invest in our priorities. Um, the most vulnerable people are gonna be left behind when we talk about climate change uh, if we don't proactively include them in the solutions. So the things that I highlight for Vermonters is that a regional transportation climate initiative, for example, would provide us tools to invest in programs like Mileage Smart, Replace Your Ride, two programs that support our uh, lowest and moderate income Vermonters to switching into uh, high efficiency or all electric vehicles. So it's those types of programs that once I express that to Vermonters, that it clicks. It's like, okay, it's not an is or situation. It's we need to invest to actually include folks who will be left behind without um, that investment. So that's the way that I talk to Vermonters about it. And it seems to resonate. Um, 
And if folks are concerned about affordability in the short term, uh, even states like what uh, Representative Stevens highlighted earlier, even states that we talked to at that conference who put something like a freeze on the gas tax, they still saw an increased cost in their gas prices. So some of those short term quick injection solutions that other states tried that do have continual negative effects on their revenue also didn't work. <laughs> so we're not going to take a short-term uh, rush to fix it approach. Um, and we can't do that while also prioritizing climate. So, And I know the advocates were at the door too. So I'm sure you're the VPIRG canvassers heard from it. <laughs> if, I, if I can add okay. one more thing, um, Paul, just for a moment. Um, Calvin, this is, I'm not sure there's anything more critical frankly, than the key issue of affordability. Because if we lose people on that, um, then we lose this entire conversation. And I think there are two pieces to keep in mind. First of all, uh, we have many, many hundreds, if not thousands of programs that we can point to where we have designed them in a way that they are income tiered. And so that if you are the person who is not gonna be left behind. You can buy your Tesla, you can put the solar on your roof, you can put in a ground source heat pump, you don't need support. Uh, it's the folks as you work down that tier uh, that really need that support, particularly when so much of the cost reduction for these projects comes from a federal tax credit. So first of all, we do have tools in the toolbox to address this in terms of really looking at that income tier. And second of all, I mentioned the one and a half billion dollars. These are dollars we're spending every year and they're just gone. So the key here for me is how do we design programs so that the savings you get over a 15 year investment, instead of a new boiler, when your boiler fails, instead of investing in that, you're investing in some heat pumps. How do you get that 15 year savings through your financing loan? How do you get that applied up front? So that the homeowner is paying the same every month to heat their home. But ultimately, they're not actually at the whims of what we see with fossil fuels in terms of how much it goes up in cost and down in cost. I don't know if that helps, but um, I really, I, if there's one thing I can put out there, um, affordability and addressing climate change are not at odds. They go hand in hand. Yeah. Thanks so much, Representative Stebbins. I wanted to just echo some of that and to say, you know, failing to act on climate is among the worst things that you can do for lower income Vermonters. They suffer the worst harm because of the climate crisis that we are in. There's no question about that. So anybody who says, you know, failing to act on climate, not doing everything we can here is somehow saving money for those who are of lower or moderate income is not telling the truth. We have to act. What we have to do is do it sensibly so that our clean transportation, clean heating, and clean electricity options are available and open to everybody. They, you know, uh, uh, an EV um, or clean heating options, they can't be the playthings of the rich. Everybody needs to be able to participate in our clean heating solutions and our clean transportation and our clean uh, electricity, clean energy solutions here moving forward. I think you'll find that we are all committed to that, but we are all in that together. It's just that the harms that we suffer now and for, th for the foreseeable future are suffered worse by those who are of lower income. And so we have to, this is a commitment that we have to address this in order to help those um, who really need that help the most. I guess just a, a, a quick follow-up, and it's um, kind of on a, on a separate program, but of the same vein, um, net metering. The uh, the PUC lowered rates for, for net metering this past summer. Um, maybe this is a question for legislators as well. Do you see any changes coming coming to that program? And, and in that same way, what, what, what do you see as a vision for the net metering program going forward? We're playing chicken with each other. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I would actually turn to the advocates on this point. Um, we're going to be uh, having serious conversations with the renewable energy standard that we've talked about, that Representative Stebbins talked about. Um, and I think the goal that every person 
um, who's a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus has, is to make uh, renewable energy affordable and incentivized for Vermonters and to have it be a part of our portfolio when we look at our energy breakout. So I don't know necessarily what the right legislative response is, but um, I know that we've got advocates and folks who are working closely on that topic. So I would, I don't know, Representative Sevens, you're like on the ground on this, <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know if I'm on the ground, I used to be. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, you know, net metering uh, has done a tremendous um, amount for really spearheading uh, solar in the state and making it affordable for a lot of folks. Um, what I see from my other job um, as a as an energy consulting professional uh, is that um, we're seeing this discussion across the nation uh, in terms of you know how as as we see more solar as we see more net metering how do we maintain that affordability how do we maintain that reliability there's some really interesting uh, initiatives in terms of community solar net metering um, income qualification. Uh, programs to make sure that the folks who maybe weren't able to participate earlier are able to participate now. We're also seeing a lot of programs where it's solar plus storage um, to raise the overall value of that system. Um, so uh, I guess I'd echo Senator-elect White in that I couldn't say right now what that's going to look like. I know it'll be discussed um, just because there are so many people uh, that it's it's important for, um, and it's a key tool in the toolbox. Um, but there are there are a lot of policy options there, and I know a lot of folks are looking at them. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, it oh, looks like Calvin, you might have another one. <laughs> Sorry, I, I have one more and it's it's a legislature question or legislative kind of election question, not necessarily on climate for, for Paul Burns, if, if I may. Sure. Uh, where where do we stand with um, ranked choice voting? Do you see that making a, a, an, a comeback or another proposal this session? Yeah, I think um, I think ranked choice voting both here and across the country, there's uh, a strong and growing interest there. Um, you uh, no doubt are following Burlington. It will be used for the first time in a council race uh, early next month for that special election, I think on the 6th of December. Um, that uh, And then of course it will be used for all council races in, on town meeting day next year in Burlington. Uh, but what we'll be focusing on Calvin is actually putting ranked choice voting in place in Vermont for the next presidential primary. Uh, so that'll be in 2024. And that'll be an, a wonderful opportunity for Vermonters all across the state to have a chance to use the process uh, and use it on a ballot where the only thing on that ballot is the presidential campaign, is, is the presidential primary. So there's no confusion about it. It's kind of a nice um, uh, pilot project, if you will, to 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 bring it in front of uh, all voters across the state. Um, it's something, as I'm sure you know, the incoming Secretary of State, Sarah Copeland Hansis, has expressed support for. Um, we will have new chairs in House and Senate of government operations, but uh, we're communicating with a lot of legislators, uh, leaders about this, and I think that there'll be an openness to it. Um, but uh, but we've got some work to do, but I think it'll be a, a, a focused uh, a piece of legislation trying to put it in place for the presidential primary. And of course, there are about uh, five or six states in the District of Columbia that um, have been using it uh, or have used it, and of course, will use it for the next presidential primary. And that's a mix of red and blue states, so-called as well. This is not, not about one party or or um, or anything like that. So um, I'm hoping that we'll find some good support for that. And that will be one more step in the process. Of course, our ambition is to go further for, for other federal offices, but I would think in 2023, we will go for the presidential primary piece. Thanks for asking. Yeah, thank you. Great, all right. Last call for any questions. We've kept you a little longer than we'd said already, but happy to answer any last. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, everyone, and great to see you and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.